Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Stanwin Diaz. I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician. I'm also an endocrinologist and I'm an infertility expert. And today I'm coming up with my new particular video that is on vaginal discharges and the related problems. Now why I've chosen this particular topic is many a times many women have a particular vaginal discharge and it is quite common and also there are different types of vaginal discharges that a woman goes through during her particular entire tenure. So it is very important for every woman to know that particular discharge apart from the discharge that is occurring during the menstrual cycle that is in terms of the blood and the clot. So what I'm going to talk about is the discharge apart from that in this section. And as we are going to discuss, we will also see the related problems to it and how to overcome it. I'm doing this particular series of lectures under my Stalin Foundation. So all these particular lectures are going to be free and they will also be available on my channel. So let's get started and see what I'm going to discuss today. So I'm going to discuss, first of all, what is vaginal discharge? I'll further discuss why it occurs. What is a normal discharge? What is abnormal discharge? So a woman should be able to uh, classify what is normal and what is abnormal discharge. How to do it, I'm also going to explain. I'm also going to explain the reasons why you are getting abnormal discharge and what can happen if the particular abnormal discharge is left untreated. Will it affect your fertility? Will it affect you in conceiving in the later stage? And what are the particular remedies that can be taken care to treat it? I'm also going to discuss in this session. So let's get started and go with the first particular point. So what is basically a vaginal discharge? It is basically a sort of a fluid that is released by the glands in a vagina and a cervix. And the majority component of it basically comes from the cervix. Whereas from the vaginal wall, the component that is responsible for releasing this discharge are these two glands, which we call is the scanic particular gland and Bartholin's gland. To make the things more clear from what I said here, let us have a look at the picture. So this is a particular picture of your particular vagina. So basically the outside what you see is the libia majora and minora. Here on top you see your clitoris. Here you see your urethral opening. This is your vaginal particular walls, vaginal canal. And inside over here, you will find the cervix, which is not visible in this particular picture. But in this picture, the two things that are more visible are the skin's glands, which you see over here, and the Bartholin's glands over here, which are responsible for generating your vaginal discharge. That is from the vagina. Later, we'll also go and see from the cervix point of view. So by now, you know what is a vaginal discharge and who produces it. And by now, we also see where these particular glands are located actually in the body, which goes about the generation of that particular discharge. Further, we'll see why it occurs. So having seen what is a discharge and from where it is coming, it is also important to know for every woman why it occurs. So basically what we say is your particular vaginal environment consists or comprises of many good bacteria. But as we know, the lifespan of the bacteria is very small. They tend to die. And there is a need to flush off those particular dead bacteria or dead cells. So vaginal discharge is a sort of a mechanism initiated by your own body to flush off these particular dead cells. It basically also helps in keeping our vagina clean and prevents the infections. The moment you eliminate or get rid of these particular dead cells, definitely to some extent, it will keep your vagina clean, of course, and also will help in preventing the infection. Now further, the amount of discharge that has been released, it also varies in amount. It also varies in terms of the color. It can also vary in terms of the texture. And what is more important for that particular discharge is it should not have any smell. It should be odorless. 
So if these particular conditions are met, then definitely we can see the discharge that has been coming out is a normal discharge. Whereas if a particular discharge has a smell, it may be a foul or a fishy smell, then definitely there is a very high chance that you have got an infection and definitely in that case, the discharge becomes a sort of abnormal discharge. Also the thing you need to make a note that the particular color of the particular discharge for some of the infections may match with the color that you may find in a normal discharge, but definitely one clear distinction that is going to be there is in terms of the smell. Whereas a normal discharge is odorless, whereas here you are going to get the foul or a fishy smell. So this is the slide which explains you why a particular discharge occurs. So in simple terms, it is your body's mechanism to flush off the dead particular cells which are there or which are generated after the bacterial bacteria have died or other particular good particular uh, fungal uh, activities which goes on inside. So it's also a particular method of or a mechanism to clear your particular vaginal environment. Next, I'm going to focus on cervical flu. So as I told you before, that a vaginal discharge is contributed by two things. One is by vagina and the one is by the cervix. So by now we have seen from the vaginal aspect of it. Now let us see from the cervical aspect of it. So what is cervix? So if you see this diagram is here is your vagina, which we have already seen in the previous particular slide. So the portion that I was talking about in the previous slide is this. And of course, your both those glands will be located here somewhere outside. Further inside is your cervical area. So basically, this is the cervix. And inside here, you will find uterus and further your particular uh, fallopian tubes and the ovaries. So this we basically call it as upper reproductive uh, system. And these are your low, lower reproductive system in the female reproductive system and around. Now, what is cervical flu? A cervical flu is that particular flu that is basically present in this particular area where your cervix is located. And I would say it plays a significant role in your conceiving and also a significant role in not conceiving. So let me explain you in detail what, what, do, I, what do I mean by that. So, for any pregnancy to happen, no doubt we know that you need to have an egg and a sperm. But definitely along with that, what is also very important is a very fertile cervical fluid which is present or located in this particular region. The reason behind it is, it is going to allow your sperm because ultimately the sperm is, has to travel from this particular channel into the uterus where a female egg may be released from here and then the fertilization has to take place somewhere in this area. So for that, the sperm has to travel this, through this particular canal and in this particular canal is nothing but your cervical fluid is present. So the, one of the objective of the cervical particular fluid is it allows the sperm to enter your uterus and reach the egg during the ovulation phase. So it provides a good environment for the sperm to traverse from here and fertilize your egg which is released from the ovary during your ovulation phase and that's how the normal conceiving process will take place. Next further if we see is the cervical fluid is always varies in consistency. It will vary in opacity. It will also vary in terms of the volume and also this is the only reason why you will find this amount of changes that is occurring in the cervical flu is because as you are moving through your particular menses cycle, definitely there are changes in your hormones in your body and that is contributing to a major factor in the differences that you may find in the cervical flu, which is also contributing to the generation of your vaginal discharge. So if you see this particular other diagram, I have purposely put this with the notation that this may be your cervical fluid. 
So if this particular thing is more fertile, it is definitely going to attract this particular sperms and the sperms will go through this channel and ultimately will go inside. Suppose here it's a, it's a uterus and it will go inside and try to fertilize the egg. So having a good fertile particular cervical fluid is very important in the ovulation phase, during the ovulation phase of a woman so that definitely the sperm can pass through here easily and do the fertilization process. So that's why I said for a good pregnancy, definitely along with egg and sperm, the fertile cervical fluid also is a necessary thing. Further, let me go to the other aspect of it. As I told you, the particular cervical fluid will change in its consistency, opacity and the color because of the change in the hormone that takes place in your body during your menses cycle. So basic two important thing that cervical fluid takes care of is it, it changes itself to make it easy for the sperm to pass through it. At the same time, it also changes itself to make it difficult to pass through the cervix into the uterus. So if you have seen my previous video, during your ovulation phase, definitely we want the sperm to go th to pass through it and definitely carry out the process of fertilization. So during when a woman is in ovulation phase, that is the time the cervical fluid will act in one particular position where it will allow the particular sperm to pass through it and carry out the fertilization. Whereas on the other hand, when you are in a luteal phase, we definitely know that even if you have a sexual contact during that time and if the sperm tries to go inside and to a particular uterus, definitely the fertilization will not take place. So at that particular time, what the cervical fluid does is it makes it equally difficult for the sperm to go over here inside and do the fertilization. Because we know that in the, in the luteal phase, definitely a woman cannot a particular fertilization cannot uh, take place in that particular phase. So this is the particular reason why your cervical fluid will act in two different particular entities based on the different phases you are in during your menstrual period. So what is the advantage of the cervical fluid? It also protects the sperm from the acidic environment from your vagina. So when a woman is in ovulation phase, definitely you want the sperm to pass from here and go inside and do the fertilization process. So usually the particular environment in the woman's vagina is more acidic. And if the sperm is exposed to this more acidic nature, then there are very high chances that they, it might affect the motility as well as the structure of the particular sperm and they become inefficient to make to fertilize a particular egg. So uh, one good thing that a cervical fluid also does is it basically remains in alkaline state to some extent so that the alkaline and the acidic nature of the, of the vaginal environment can be neutralized and it protects your particular sperm from a particular damage so that it doesn't affect the motility of the sperm as well as the structure of the particular sperm. One more advantage that a cervical fluid has is it carries a lot of antibodies which basically helps to keep away the unhealthy bacteria and viruses which may be present in the vagina. So that is additional advantage of a particular vaginal fluid or a cervical fluid what we basically call. So these are the three advantages. So it will allow a particular sperm to pass through it when it is required, that is basically during ovulation phase, and it will equally make the sperm difficult to pass through it when you are in luteal phase. It creates a good environment for a sperm to pass through when you are in ovulation phase by neutralizing the acidic particular nature of the vagina, the vaginal environment. And it also harbors the antibodies which helps to kill the unhealthy particular bacteria and the viruses. So if we just see this particular diagram, I've taken it from my particular live consultancy, is this is a particular image of the cervix that you see. So in the previous particular image, we had seen a vagina in detail. 
So this is now the inner structure of the vagina that is basically your cervix. So these are your vaginal walls and this is your cervix and this is a particular channel through which the particular sperm goes inside and on the other side of this there is a uterus. Let me also remind you this is the particular same opening from your, which your blood also comes out during a menses along with the clot, clots and also this is the same opening from which a baby may come out during the vaginal delivery. So you can imagine to the extent to which this particular small entity can stretch itself. So let's go to the next particular section. So here what I'm going to demonstrate you is how your cervical fluid changes during your entire particular one month phase of your menstrual cycle. So as you must be aware, in my previous videos, I mentioned or I explained in detail, your menstrual particular cycle will comprise of the four phases, that is menstrual phase, then the follicle phase, then the ovulation phase and then the luteal phase. I will not go into the details of it, but I will only try to highlight over here that what particular happens to your cervical fluid as you pass through these different phases. And it is equally important for every woman to make a note of this particular changes or this changes in terms of the fluid that has been discharged. Apart from your normal fluid, which, we, which most of the women keep track of, is during the menstruation phase when the blood and the clots are released. So keeping a note of this other discharge that is also going out from your vagina is equally important for every woman and she should not neglect this particular uh, watching or keeping track of this kind of discharge. So let us go in detail uh, what happens in each phase. So in the first particular phase that you see here is a menstruation phase where basically you are particularly bleeding and definitely uh, there will be blood and a particular clots and you won't find any particular discharge that is vaginal discharge or cervical fluid being produced during this particular phase. Let me also explain why it is so is this particular fluid what we are talking about is basically generated by a hormone called as estrogen. And in this particular phase, that is menstruation phase, the estrogen is almost at a very low level. It is not zero, but it is less than what has been required to produce this particular discharge. As such, you won't find any particular fluid or vaginal fluid being produced during this phase. Next, once your particular bleeding has stopped, then just after your particular period has stopped, you will basically find your vagina is basically dry and there won't be any particular discharge or some amount of wetness may be observed, but it is not much as such. So again, this lasts for about two or three days. So no fluid is going to come up or no discharge will actually occur during this particular phase because your estrogen levels are still low and slowly the estrogen level is increasing. So in your next particular phase, comes is the follicle phase which basically starts from here itself and as I discussed before in your follicle phase the estrogen level starts to increase slowly. So as that particular estrogen levels are increasing slowly then definitely you will find the different discharges that has been coming out from your vagina. So it may be thick discharge or it may be sticky or it may also be tacky initially. It may become more wet or cream or some of you might also get like a discharge like a lotion, body lotion. And as you approach your ninth and 10th day of the menstrual cycle, that time it may look more whitish or cloudy or even yellowish. Now remember all this even the color it may look yellowish or it may look whitish but as long as you don't have any particular smell to this particular discharge that is the odorless and you don't have any itchiness or rashes in your vaginal particular area, definitely we can say this particular discharge is a normal discharge. Then, once you are in the ovulation phase, so this phase is basically a follicle phase, what we are talking about, and your discharge is more bound to be like this in this particular phase. In a particular next phase that comes up is the ovulation phase wherein basically the egg is released from the ovaries into the fallopian tube and now the structure of your particular discharge may look a little bit different. 
it may get a feel like an egg like structure i mean with except the yolk the other part that you see in a particular egg the discharge may be something like that it may be very much transparent or clear it may be little bit slippery it may also be scrunchy because this is the time when a particular woman can conceive at such the discharge now creates an environment for the sperm to pass through it and go into the uterus and carry out the fertilization a next important change that you will also observe is the discharge over here has increased by 10 to 20% which was not there in this particular period of time so here now the discharge you will find is more clear more uh, like watery it may be like egg like little bit slippery and definitely in terms of volume 10 to 20% increase in volume to some extent you will observe compared to this phase then going after the ovulation phase is over your next phase comes is the luteal phase now the discharge takes the other, other particular form wherein now even as i told you before even if you have the intercourse and sperm passes through it then definitely the chances of fertilization are almost nil at such the discharge becomes more fibrous so it becomes more difficult for the sperm to pass through it and in a day or two after your ovulation amount of the fluid decreases quickly so in this slowly slowly the discharge will come down and definitely after that your menstruation phase will be so this is that particular phase wherein it x wherein it helps the particular sperm to pass through it so it takes one form this is the particular phase in takes the other form wherein it makes it equally difficult for a particular sperm to pass through it because the chances of conceiving are almost nil so every woman should understand that in a one month period these are all the changes that are occurring in her particular body in terms of the vaginal discharge so again i'm repeating when i say vaginal discharge it is not the blood i'm talking about when your period starts it is after that until you get your next bleeding of the next particular period that particular discharge i'm talking about in this section here are some of the particular pictures that are put up pertaining to a normal discharge so a discharge may be somewhat like this during your ovulation phase so this is again a cervix that cervical picture that i have seen from my consultation this is definitely you may find a discharge something like this take up on your panty that may be little bit white that as you are approaching ovulation phase you may find something like this you may find little bit sticky you may find little bit stringy with a difference in color provided that it is not having any smell and you don't have any itchiness or a rashes in your vagina all this particular discharge can be considered as a normal discharge for the normal discharge is usually produced in this range about 1 to 4 ml of it in a in a time span of 24 hours it is usually white and transparent it is also sometimes thick or thin and mostly as i told you it is odorless so it is very important that we understand this particular concept thoroughly so having now discussed all about a normal vaginal discharge let me go to the next slide and explain what is abnormal discharge so the major problem lies here is when your discharge can be considered as abnormal so we have seen now extensively what is normal discharge now let us focus in the later part of our particular session on abnormal discharge so the first and foremost a discharge is abnormal if it differs in color if there is a change in color it is abnormal what are the different types of colors you can get i am going to explain shortly if the consistency of it also changes definitely it's abnormal definitely if it is, it is having odor as i told you before it is abnormal and its quantity compared to the normal discharge if it varies then also it is abnormal because in the previous slide i told you a normal discharge we generated about 1 to 4 ml per day that is 24 hour cycle and but if the quantity also comparatively becomes more then definitely it is abnormal so what are the symptoms that your body will get when you have abnormal discharge so the first symptom is you are going to get abnormal discharge 
wherein all these particular points are becoming valid, you may feel more fatigued. That is another symptom. You may definitely get some stomach cramps or pain. Now, these stomach cramps and or pains, I'm not talking about the ones that are occurring prior to your blood flow, but you may find it even after your blood has stopped that you may still get the stomach cramps or pain. So this is one of the reasons that which indicates that you have some sort of the infection which is responsible for creating this abnormal discharge. Some women are associated with headaches and also the constipation. So I will state down some of the common symptoms that your body may observe that in the case of abnormal discharge, that is in the case of having an infection. This particular uh, picture indicates the environment in your vagina. So this is a healthy environment wherein you may find there are some good bacteria which I was talking about before. And also there might be also a bad bacteria, but the quantity of the good bacteria are more compared to that of the bad bacteria. On the other slide, if you see this is in this, there are a lot of infections, there are a lot of bad bacteria, bad fungus, bad particular uh, infections that has been occurred over here. As such, the quantity of the good bacteria that you see here is very low and totally it's covered by the bad bacteria or the other sort of the fungal infections. So this is basically is what we term in terms of the vaginal environment in terms of a normal one and in terms of the abnormal one. So let us go and explore more into details of this. So any discharge that is coming out from your vagina is termed as leucorrhea. So some, instead of C, also write K over here. It means the same thing. And so leucorrhea is basically a discharge coming out from the vagina. It can be a good discharge or normal discharge as well as it can be an abnormal discharge. So for both these things, we basically call it as a leucorrhea term, term given to a discharge coming out from the vagina. Now the, it is basically classified into two categories. One is physiological and one is inflammatory or pathological. Now let us see the category of the physiological aspect of leucorrhea. So as I told you, a normal discharge is also part of it. So a normal discharge that is occurring due to the changes in your particular hormone during a one month period cycle is also classified as a physiological leukemia. Next one, a discharge that occurs during your early stage of the pregnancy is also a physiological leukemia. A discharge that occurs during your sexual excitement or when a woman is having an orgasm that particular discharge which is coming out from your vagina is also a type of physiological leukorrhea. A girl who is achieving a particular puberty and she may also observe a particular discharge prior to the start of the menses is also termed as a part of physiological leukorrhea. And even if you observe a particular significant amount of discharge may also be observed in a newborn baby for about a one week if there is a presence of maternal estrogen. That is, if a baby has gained a significant amount of estrogen from the particular mother, then definitely also a particular uh, discharge may be observed in a newborn baby for a period of one week. So, if you observe in this particular case, the physiological leukemia can cover up the woman in different ages, right from the time of its born, also in during the puberty phase, during a particular sexual excitement phase, sexually active phase, during the pregnancy, and this is a normal cycle phase, wherein it is quite common that you may also uh, you may get physiological leukemia. So this is absolutely normal, and you don't require at all any particular treatment to tackle this. The problem comes in this particular phase, wherein we call it as inflammatory or pathological leukemia. So first thing, what what you observe here is you observe abnormal discharge. So what is abnormal discharge? We have already seen before. And definitely whenever there is an abnormal discharge, it definitely requires a pathological investigation. That means it needs to be tested. It needs to be, uh, a sample needs to be taken from the swipe from your vagina. It needs to be set, uh, sent to a pathological lab. And there 
a particular culture can be developed to find out what is actually causing that particular abnormal discharge. So in the later section, I will be focusing on this part. So let's first try to find out what are the reasons for pathological liquidity. So first and foremost is a bacterial imbalance. Now, as I told you, your vaginal particular environment harbors a good bacteria, but if that balance gets disturbed and your bad bacteria becomes more and the good ones becomes less, then definitely you are going to get the infection. So that is bacterial imbalance. Next one is a yeast infection. So this is another kind of infection that is quite common in a woman and it can be treated also quite easily. I, I'm going to tell you about it in the later stage. So this is another reason why you may get a particular discharge. Next one is a sexually transmitted infection. So we basically call it as STI. So usually you get it from your partner during the sexual particular act. It may be, you may receive it from a man or you may also receive, a, man, a woman can also transmit it to a man. So it is both the way possible. Next particular uh, reason is poor hygienic maintenance. So definitely you need to particular clean your vaginal area properly and also dry it, especially during your menses phase and also during the other phase as well. So many a times a poor hygienic uh, maintenance of your vaginal area results in generation of at least this first two particular infection that is bacterial and the yeast infection. So if you keep it, then definitely you are minimizing this two particular risk. And the reason you may get is urinary tract infection. Many times the woman have the tendency to withheld the urine for a longer period of time, maybe because of different reasons, and it may result in the generation of harboring the bacteria inside the urinary tract and definitely it can cause a lot of infections. Second point I would also like to mention is the urinary bladder of a woman is smaller compared to that of a particular man. So definitely the storage capacity of it becomes less and further what adds to it is we tend, a woman tend to stay, uh, store the particular urine for a longer period of time before it releases. So that's why I always tell my particular patient that don't withheld your particular urine, no matter where you are. Try to see a particular convenient place and try to release it on time rather than just storing it because you are increasing your chances of getting a UTI. Next one is a vaginal irritation that may be caused because of insertion of contraceptives. So the, for the couples who are using some contraceptive methods like the IUD and all, and uh, definitely it may result in causing some vaginal irritation during the sexual activity and as such it may also contribute to the generation of the patholo uh, pathological liquidity. One more reason that has been also observed quite common is cervical cancer and this is also quite common in women nowadays. So apart from the breast cancer, next highest cancer that definitely occurs in a woman is the cervical one. So it needs to be, it, it basically requires a thorough examination to filter out whether it belongs to this category or whether it belongs to this category. And again, I would like to make a point that anytime if you observe a abnormal discharge, immediately go and visit your particular doctor, don't particular waste your time. Because more time you particular take, definitely you are allowing the infections to spread and then it requires more particular complicated procedures, more particular complicated medicines to be administered to you to, or to make the things clear. And the particular thing is gouging. So many times the uh, women have feeling that whatever the smell that is coming from a discharge is coming from inside the vagina, but basically it is not the case. Only when the discharge comes out and exposed to the particular air, you tend to get the odor. And at such, they have tried to use some particular soap or particular other materials which are fragrant, which have a good fragrance, and they try to clean the vaginal environment. So in, what happens in that is instead of helping it out, it makes your things more worst because those chemicals ultimately makes or interferes or basically kills whatever the good bacteria that you had inside. And at such, definitely makes the condition more worse rather than helping it out. So please try to avoid it doing this gouging. 
Next one is using the production. So sometimes the male and female condom, whatever they use, definitely sometimes they have the fragments. Sometimes they also have the new condoms or the male, the one that the male uses have some dots, etc. For the sexual particular pleasure, they are more efficient. That is, whenever a particular sexual activity goes, then it tries to stimulate the particular walls of the vagina. But at the same time, what can also happen is it may result in generation of some minor cuts in the vaginal wall. And the bad bacteria, if they are present, then they can infest into this particular cuts and the things can become more infectious. So these are some of the reasons why you can get a pathological leukoria. Here is a picture wherein I have depicted how a particular abnormal discharge looks like. So here you may find that uh, on the tissue you may find a yellow discharge. This is also a little bit more sticky and yellowish in color with the span. This is more whitish particular discharge. But again, a smell will be a contributing factor to this. So this is the pathological liquidity. So, the next thing that I would like to highlight from here is, is what are the different types of the discharges that we have. So as I told you, in leukuria, there is a definitely change in the particular color of the discharge. So the change in the color of the discharge are basically associated over here and I have noted down it also over here. So first and foremost, the discharge can be clear. That is normally in case of your normal discharge without any itchiness or staining. Next thing, if your discharge is more white or more milky, then definitely it is, there are particular chances of yeast infection or it is more like a cheese, then also we say that there is a yeast infection and definitely you will find more itchiness in your vaginal area when you have yeast infection. Other particular color that you may also encounter is your discharge may be a little bit more yellow or maybe a little bit greenish in color. Of course, it may not match exactly with the color that I have listed down here. And the reason that it gets this color is because when you have a STI, that is sexual transmitted infections, you tend to get some blisters and definitely a pus gets generated in the blisters. And whenever that particular pus is released, it gets mixed with your cervical fluid and that's what it gives it the color that is either yellow or a little bit a greenish one. Other color that is associated is the gray color. The color may not exactly match with this, but if you have a particular grayish discharge, then definitely it is a bacterial infection. We basically call it as a bacterial vaginosis. So that is also quite common. And further, if you have a discharge like a red, I'm not talking about a red discharge during your normal blood flow in your menses cycle, but apart from it, again, if you start observing a particular discharge that is more red, then definitely it means that some reproductive tract bleeding has occurred and there's some sort of infection in your reproductive tract. It may be in the uterus, it may be also in the fallopian tubes, or there might be also some fibroids which are basically responsible for giving this the red clotted blood with some mucus during that phase. Again, I'm reminding, I'm not talking about the menstrual flow that what you get on, uh, during your menses, but this is after that. Sometimes you may also get a discharge which is pink in color. So basically it's a cervical, it basically occurs do, uh, during the cervical or implantation bleeding. Even in case of the cervical cancers, the initial particular bleeding is somewhat pinkish and then gradually it darkens into a particular bloodish discharge. So you need to be very critical in observing all these things and if you see any abnormality, report to your doctor immediately. So let's go to the next slide. Here now I'm going to highlight the different particular kinds of the infections that you may get. The first and foremost is cervicitis. So it is basically inflammation of your uterine cervix. 
And what are the other symptoms that you observe is you may find a pain in the lower back. You may also find the inflammation is caused because of the sexually transmitted diseases or STI. The inflammation may also occur because of the use of intrauterine devices. This is a sort of a contraceptive device. Or a particular reaction or a, may also occur because many times the couple trying to use a contraceptives that is uh, 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 the spermicide creams to kill the sperms that can also create irritation and the swelling in the cervix. So cervicitis is basically inflammation of your cervix and it may be caused because of these reasons. So here I've listed down some of the pictures which indicates how it looks like. So basically this is a little bit of your normal cervix with some particular abnormal discharge. Here if you observe definitely the cervix has inflammated or swollen a little bit and you may also find the particular rashes or redness observed here. This is much more inflated particular cervix. This is in the process of starting or spreading of the infection wherein the swelling has just built up around the surrounding area and here if you observe definitely some sort of infections has started. So these are the images of cervicitis. Now the reason behind putting this image is by looking at this you may get a feel how complex the infection may be inside whereas from outside you cannot make it out that much and that's why I was I'm saying once abnormal discharge is observed immediately go and visit your particular doctor because we need to prevent the spread of these infections immediately. I go to the next particular discharge or infection which is quite common in a particular woman that is called a yeast infection. Now what are uh, the symptoms of it and who can get it? A particular uh, woman who is diabetic can get it because if your sugar level is high then definitely it helps the yeast particular to grow. Again I would like to mention yeast is present in, all, uh, in, in our body always. But if you try to create an environment which helps it to grow, then definitely it will grow at a faster rate and creates an infection. So a diabetic particular woman are also more prone to getting this. A pregnant woman also there are high chances of getting it because of the particular reason that in the later stage of pregnancy, she cannot clean up her vaginal part more appropriately as such because of unhygienic particular condition that may result up definitely they may also get taste infection. Sometimes the antibiotics or the birth control pills that you use, which imbalances your hormonal level, may also result in generation of taste infection. The changes in your pH level. pH level is nothing but the a level of your acidic and the alkaline nature, which I had already explained before. So if there is a sudden change in this level, then it proliferates the growth of this, this particular infection. And that's how that's how you can get it. Unhygienic condition I already explained before. That is also responsible for it. And usually wearing a particular a dent undergarment also helps in proliferating this this particular infection. So these are the reasons why you can get it. And here I put up the particular pictures how a yeast infection may look like. So when it is when the discharge has occurred. And definitely you may find it on the particular panty but after it dries off you may get a little bit of yellowish texture. Here if you observe it is also sticky and more whitish. So usually these yeast infections are discharges more white. Here you can see a clear indication of the vaginal wall with the yeast infection. In this you may find two kind of infections. So the yeast infection is here and this discharge is a little bit of the yellowish which indicates there is also an STI. So it's not that at the time we may get only one infection, sometimes more than one infection can also be clubbed together. So it becomes a challenge for the doctor to identify which is a prominent particular infection that is flourishing and which is the next level infection and then give the appropriate treatment. So visiting a doctor at the right time is very important in this case. The third category of the discharge that we have is trichromosomal vaginitis. These are basically related to your STI that is sexually transmitted infections. And what are the symptoms that you observe? The first and foremost that you observe is the bumps on the genital or the rectal area. So at your rectal or 
in your particular vaginal area, you may find a sort of the bumps or the soreness. Next, you may find painful or pain while passing the urine. Now, this may also happen if you have urinary tract infection, but you may also get it when you have the sexually transmitted infection. You will definitely get odd smelling vaginal discharge. So, a smell becomes more stringent in this particular infection compared to the bacterial in the yeast infection. You will definitely also find unusual vaginal bleeding that is also quite common when you have these STI things. You will, when you will find a lot of pain when you are in a sexual act and definitely you will find the soreness as well as the itching of your vaginal area. Now there are a list of the STI diseases. I am not going to explain in detail of it. Maybe in the one more particular session I will go into the details of it but I would like to make a list of them. The first and foremost is a human papilloma virus. Now, many a time this can be also avoided by taking a injection of HPV, which generates an antidote or antibodies for this particular virus in your body. So if you have, if I taken that particular injection, then definitely to many particular extent, this infection can be eliminated. Next common is the gonorrhea, which is a bacterial infection. Next one is Chlamydia, which is also a bacterial infection. You may also get genital herpes. These are also common. And trichromonosis that is related to a parasite. So I just listed down some of them. It doesn't mean that only this, much, this many STIs are available, but most common ones I have highlighted here. Let us uh, go and have a look how these infections may look like. So your HPV virus, maybe like this this is your genital warts which is which has grown outside and these are the genital warts which have grown inside your vaginal canal so how this may look like this here you may have the gonorrhea case here you may have the syphilis case here you may have the ring bomb case here, here you have chest v2 virus so these are the particular viruses and these are how your uh, sti infections to some extent may look like then let us now classify all these abnormal vaginal discharges, what we have seen. So we have three categories, bacterial, yeast, and the trichromosis, that is your STI. So what kind of discharge do you observe? Here you will find bacterial, you will find a grayish or whitish with the smell. Your uh, symptoms will be genital pain, itching, and burning sensation. It is not a type of STI, and you need to go and visit your doctor immediately. In case of the yeast infections, a discharge may be thick, it may be a little bit more white, chucky, it may be a little bit having a less odor compared to this and slightly it will have less smell. Definitely you will have the genital itchiness, you will have the swelling a little bit and you may also see the readiness or a little bit sort of rash. It is not a STI. Now when it comes to yeast infection, you can initially try out some home remedies for few days and if it doesn't subside then definitely you need to go and visit your doctor. The third category is the STI particular category wherein the discharge is yellowish and greenish as, and definitely it will have a lot of foul smell uh, compared to these two. Next one the, sim uh, the symptoms are genital itchiness, burning, soreness and also a little bit red redness because of the soreness is been also observed. It is definitely a STM. And here you cannot spend more time. You need to immediately go and consult your doctor. And in many cases, we also test the other partner uh, for this particular disease and definitely also start the treatment for both of them. Now, what is going to happen if you leave this particular abnormal discharges untreated? First and foremost, you have a high chance of getting a HIV infection if you leave it untreated. There are also high chances if you're pregnant and if you leave it untreated to get a premature delivery because usually the vagina, the cervix which has been present, if it withholds your particular baby from coming out of the uterus to the external world. But if you find a particular infection that is occurring at the cervix, then definitely it may prevent those particular muscles from withholding during your pregnancy and as such it may result in a generation of premature delivery. Again, 
if you have bacterial or these infections and if you don't treat it then it may also result you may also have a very high chances of contacting a sexual transmitted infection the next one you may also have a very high chances of developing a pelvic inflammatory disease which we basically call it as a pid so these are the diseases which will be related to the uterus to the fallopian tube and so on so if you keep your particular infection untreated there are chances it may spread inside your uterus it may also further go down the line to your fallopian tube and create more particular complications which we basically term it as the pid now when to visit a doctor if the infection is occurring again and again then definitely you need to constantly visit a doctor even if the infection is eased and i told you that initially you can treat it at home but after three or four days if you don't see much change then definitely you need to see your doctor and also if the infection is occurring again and again after the span of one month or say two months then also you need to go to a doctor and take a thorough therapy a good time to visit a doctor is when you are not in your menses so definitely a doctor can have a look at your cervix and if required a swab can be taken and sent for pathological examination so this is a good time when you can take an appointment and visit a doctor if you have this infection but don't delay it much here are some of the images i have put up which tells you that if a particular infections are left untreated what damage it can cause inside this is a swelling of your ovary that you see here again there is a clogging of the fallopian tubes here there is a mass that is generated which is cleared off and here again you find a swelling in your particular ovaries so these are the images which have been put up which indicates the level of the damage that this particular infections can make if they are not treated on time my next slide is how to overcome this from a woman aspect i am not going to talk about from the doctor aspect because definitely uh, based you need to analyze each one of those particular cases and then need to see a, for a better treatment so the first thing is hygienic care in which after every visit to a washroom you need to always clean your vagina with the water and then for the dry it off by wiping it from the front to the back and not from back to the front because if you do it from the back to the front the bad bacteria which are present in your anal cavity in anal cavity might get propagated in the front region and may find a place in your particular vagina and may create the infection always try to wear a cotton underpants avoid wearing your tight pants pantyhose swimming suits for a longer period of time next one change the contraceptive methods like some particular women they have the more allergy to the latex that is used in condoms diaphragm is again a female a female condom what we basically call and also sometimes they tend to use uh, spermicides or sperm killing particular gels which may also result in causing a lot of irritation so these are sort of a easy contraceptive method but if they don't suit you definitely try to go for the other alternative and don't continue with this next one is hot tub bath so many times a woman uh, if they feel tired and if they have a tub at home a bathing tub then definitely they tend to lie in a particular tub with the hot water for a longer period of time to relax the body but what happens in that case is uh, it also tends to affect your vaginal environment because the temperature because the water may also go into the vagina and definitely it may also create a particular sort of uh, imbalance in the temperature and may help the particular infections to grow if you sit in a particular water for a very long period of time in hours time then definitely it can proliferate the environment for the growth of a particular vaginal infections next thing is always try to have a safe and protected sexual contact so unless you are now trying to conceive always try to use a good protective mechanism clean your vagina and every time you are going to have a contact the sexual contact as well as whenever you are going to pass a urine just first clean it with the water and then wipe it properly and not just by using wiping it with your tissue paper 
Next one is bath and shower regularly and clean your genital area uh, every time, especially when you are having your bleeding during your menses, you need to have at least shower two times or more so that the area can be kept clean all the time and as such you can prevent the infection. Always try to avoid a feminine wash. I would not say feminine wash is bad but the one that is a scent, uh, more fragrance, you should always try to avoid. Also you should try to avoid uh, perfume toilet paper, a deodorant bags, 10 phones which no doubt they give you good fragments, but that particular fragrance has some chemicals which can cause the irritations in the vaginal environment and can help in the growth of the infections. Change also try to change your laundry detergents or the fabric. If you find some sort of itchiness in your genital area after wearing the panty which are washed from that particular detergent. So some, many a times uh, we try to neglect it because it could also be one of the particular cause that I've seen uh, resulting in the vaginal infections. What are the home remedies? So those were the hygienic remedies and what are the home remedies that you can do? Always try to have a healthy balanced diet. Always try to have a good particular food. Try to avoid the meat. Uh, try to have a lot of fruits, the green leafy vegetables and always have a balanced diet. So what is balanced diet? I already explained in my previous video, so I will not spend much time on this. I will just brief you about what is a balanced diet. Always try to have an intake of garlic in your food if you are facing this problem. Always also increase the intake of your vitamin C. Reduce the sugar level and carbonated drinks because this is going to help your yeast infection to grow. You can also have cranberry and blueberry juice or pills. These are good for treating UTI in a natural way. So try to have it, if you have that uh, natural particular cranberry and blueberries, try to make a juice of it and have it. Or otherwise the pill supplements are also available and they are known to be quite effective to treat UTI. Next is always try to have yogurt which is with the less sugar and homemade. Probiotic supplements you can also eat. This helps in uh, releasing your antioxidants and definitely helps in reducing the infection. If you find itchiness in our general area, you can try to apply uh, coconut oil to reduce the itchiness or the redness. Or you can also use tea tree oil, but this is all made at, from the organic particular components. Also, you can use the organo particular oil. You can even add a little bit of apple cider vinegar in your bathing particular tub and definitely you can have a particular bath with this so it also helps in preventing these infections to some extent so these are the precautions in terms of food what you can take and in terms of hygiene i already explained you the rest remedial part will be taken care by your doctor who is going to give you the required antibiotics or the medical supplements to overcome the infections with this i would like to finish my particular presentation thank you very much for listening to it now, these are the places where you can reach me. Of course, you can reach me uh, now uh, at my Facebook group, or I would say all these particular videos will be available on this particular YouTube channel that is Dr. Stanwin Dias, your gynecologist. And also I have a WhatsApp account wherein you can send me an invitation. Recently, because of some activities, my Facebook account is not working, so don't try to contact me right now on these two particular areas. But definitely you can subscribe my YouTube channel over here. And definitely in a later stage, I will let you know where to contact me. So you can see my previous videos on my YouTube channel. And also try to subscribe it so the new additions, you will be notified uh, as and when I upload it. And definitely I will also allow you to share yourself with my WhatsApp group so that the interaction becomes more faster. Okay. Thank you very much for attending this session. Have a nice day.